Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm Diane Dixon with the Agency for Life Transformations, and I'm here today with Tanya Groff. And Tanya is an ESE instructor with Brevard Public Schools, and she is one of the teachers at the Bayside BLAST program. And BLAST stands for Brevard Learners Achieving Successful Transitions. And um, Tanya is a superstar instructor with her interns. She is such an inspiration to those of us in the field. She really covers everything, every aspect of what our young people need to be equipped with to go out and have successful lives. So I'm so, so excited to have her here. The topic we wanted to bring forth to you guys today is um, we wanted to talk about cell phone use because in the current situation, our young people are spending probably a lot of time with these cell phones. And Tanya does a great job of instructing her young people on some really important aspects of cell phone use. And we thought it'd be a great idea to invite her to share with you guys um, what she teaches them. So um, I'm so glad you're here, Tanya. And I'm gonna turn it over to you and give, uh, give you a chance to uh, tell us a little bit about how you advise your interns in using their cell phones. Hi everybody. So the first thing we go over is cell phone etiquette and that's very important to use your manners when you're on the cell phone. Even though you can't see the person, you can still use your manners. If you talk with a smile, everybody can hear the smile in your voice. Using your manners, saying please and thank you and answering questions, not just shaking your head. We also talk about leaving messages. A lot of uh, students, interns, think that people don't leave messages anymore because we can text just whatever we want to text. It's very important to leave a voicemail message when you get that uh, voicemail when you make a phone call because people look for that and they look for, oh, I got a missed call. Let me see what the voicemail is. We don't always look for text messages. And when we do look for text messages, sometimes they can be misread, miscommunicated, misunderstood because you can't hear the person's voice and you can't see their face. So you don't know what they might be trying to say to you, even though you hear them say in the text message, I'm fine, I'm fine can mean many, many things. And the way you say it lets them know what you mean by that. I can say I'm fine with a smile and it means I'm okay, everything's all right. If I say I'm fine and I'm quaking in my voice, it means I'm not so good, but I don't wanna tell you right now very important to use your manners on the phone and to make sure you leave those messages when you get somebody's voicemail even though people say you don't leave messages anymore we do leave messages that's how we communicate a lot when we miss a phone call we look for that so small things to remember when you're on the phone so tanya do you find that sometimes our young people might be nervous about actually talking on the phone, especially if they're, say, maybe calling about a job or uh, even food delivery. What do, what do you advise if you feel nervous about talking on the phone? I think that is part of the problem. People don't know their voice is being recorded. They're not sure how they're going to sound. They don't like the way their voice is recorded. When my voice is recorded, I feel like I sound like a little, little girl. And I don't like it either. But I know that I have to leave a message. So what sometimes I'll do, and what I did before this interview is practice talking. Practice making sure that I know what I'm gonna to say to that person. So if I'm waiting for a job interview and I'm gonna call that person, I'm gonna practice before I call them and say, okay, this is Tanya Groff. I'm leaving you a message because I didn't get a hold of you and I just wanted to find out about my application that I put in last week. My phone number is 321 and we keep mm -hmm. repeating it. Repeat it twice. You always repeat the phone number twice and slowly so that they can write it down. But practicing ahead of time helps me a lot when I'm getting ready to leave a message or I'm getting ready to call somebody that I have something to say to them that they might not be happy about. It might be something that is going to make them upset. And I need to practice that first so that I can stay together when I'm talking with them. All right, Tanya, these are really good tips for anybody. <laughs> Right. Um, something I'm just wondering about as I'm listening to you is what about incoming phone calls where you might not recognize the phone number? 
Uh, what advice do you give for how they should handle a call from an unfamiliar phone number? Well, in today's world, I don't answer those phone calls if I don't know the phone number, I'll be honest. I let it go to my voicemail. Then I check my voicemail, and if it's somebody that I know, I call them right back and say, hey, I'm sorry I missed your call, but I got your message, so I'm calling you right back. And a lot of people do that these days because there's a lot of people out there that call cell phone numbers randomly, and they might not be the nicest people. So I just let them go to voicemail, and then I call right back afterwards if it's somebody I need to talk to. Right. Sometimes there are scams that take place and that you know we hear about, and sometimes we don't hear about them. So we really, what well, we want our young people to know that this can happen, that it, the person might not be a friendly person on the other end of the phone. Right. And so what about what about texting? What do you do? You uh, kind of run into any challenges or problems that occur for young people when they're doing a lot of texting, maybe with their friends? I do see a lot of texting between friends. A lot of it ends up in fights, I'll be honest. It ends up with mm -hmm. people arguing back and forth because like I said, text messaging can be misunderstood, miscommunicated, and people don't understand what they were actually saying. Or they might have said something small and somebody ran with it and thought they were being mean to them. And when you actually read it and you ask the person and say, hey, Diane, when you sent me the text message that said that we were going to meet at two and I'm standing here waiting for you and you're not here and it's three o'clock, what is going on? Oops, Diane mistexted me. She meant meet me at three and you weren't there yet. That can turn into a big fight because no, I've got it right here in writing. You said, well, I mistyped. It can be a mistake. Why not call Diane and say, hey, Diane, you know what? You said you meet me at two. I'm here. What's going on? And Diane can just simply tell you, hey, oh, I'm sorry. I'm at three. I must have mistyped that. So I'm so sorry. I'm on my way. And communicating through the voice is so much better than, than texting and miscommunicating. Just remembering that when you're communicating by text, it should be short and sweet and just something that you just need to send. Hey, I'm running late. Hey, you want to meet? I'll call you. We'll find out where and making sure that who you're texting is who you mean to be texting. We shouldn't be texting people we don't know. We shouldn't be texting people we met on video games. We shouldn't be texting people that send us a random text message and we don't know who they are. I get that sometimes. I'll get a random text message from somebody. I don't even know who they are. And they're asking me for my name. Well, if you don't know my name, why are you texting me? Small things like that that we think as teachers oh do I need to talk about that I think if it was my kid I would want to talk about it so let's talk about it with our students because I want them to know that not everybody is who they say they are if somebody's texting you from a video game chat which I get a lot and they're saying hey yeah I'm, I'm 18 years old and I uh, live in Orlando and I go to school at Orlando High School how do you know that they're actually 18 years old you don't you don't know that they're, who they're saying they are you don't know that they look like what their picture looks like. It could be anybody on that text message because you can't see them. They're not really a friend because you haven't met them in person. That's just another thing. Another way of communicating that we talk about is this text messaging and talking to each other through video games. It's kind of the same thing goes right into the cell phone era where we don't know who's on the other end of that text message. You don't know who's on the of that text message. So when I hear my students say things like, oh, I've got a friend who's in Orlando and we play games together online, I just cringe and think, wait a minute, does mom know who this friend is? Does dad know who this friend is? Does guardian know who this friend is? Let's let's talk to them and let them know because you never know who it could be. Right. That's, a, you know, safety, I think, is probably the, the most important thing, right? So what do you suggest to parents? Because I know... Like when the young people are now getting into that young adult age, we, we want to kind of honor their privacy and give them their space. But at the same time, we want to make sure that they're safe and they're not taking unnecessary risks. So what advice would you have for parents for helping to manage some of that safety concerns? Well, I would say keep the, the communication open between you and your, your child even if they're adults. Even now, I talk to my mom about things. I talk to my dad about things. Keep the communication open and say, hey, let me know who you're talking to or, who, oh, who's that texting you? Or what did you do today? 
uh, who did you talk to today? Who did you text today? What's going on? You know, how's so-and-so doing? Or ask about their friends. And most of the kids will open right up to you. Most of my students will come right in and say, hey, Ms. Groff, I met a new person online yet last night. Well, let's talk about that. How did you meet them? What are they saying to you? Does mom know about them? And they know that it's very important, at least my interns do, that they keep that communication with mom and dad to say, hey, this is who I'm talking to. This is who this person is. And sometimes it's not a safe person and parents have to get involved in some way. Yeah, I've heard, um, I've heard stories that were very concerning. But I've also heard examples of where people have actually been able to leverage that cell phone as a safety device where, you know, if our young people know that how to use maybe say video feature, or even if they just, you know, if they're approached by someone at the mall and they feel unsafe and they just go ahead and quick dial mom or quick dial anybody, get that telephone line open, that that would discourage, maybe discourage somebody from victimizing them, taking advantage of them in some way. So um, I think this is really, it's a, a really important discussion to have and maybe a discussion that needs to take place more than one time between parents and young people, you know, to, to where you're making sure that they remember and that they're, you know, um, staying safe and, and doing all of the steps and the things correctly. Very good information. Um, also wondering a little bit about other ways that we might encourage our young people to use their phones, maybe to help them with executive functioning or um, even sometimes reading and, and writing. What are your thoughts on using some of those different tools with the cell phone? Uh, we do have students that use their cell phone as a timer for when they're getting ready to do something so they know how long they have to do it or when lunch is going to be or when they uh, are trying to beat a clock. I bet you can't wash all those dis dishes in 10 minutes. Let's see. Um, those kind of things, they do use it as a timer. They use it as a reminder. I'll say put it in your uh, calendar that you are going to the beach on Wednesday, so make sure that you bring your shorts and your water shoes or something of that sort. So they are using some of those features. There are other features, of course, there's plenty of apps out there for anything you wanna put on your phone, but it's very important to be careful with those apps to do some research before you download them, that they can be um, spam apps, they can be scam apps, they can be uh, unlocked and not uh, appropriate for your phone or for your computer. It could cause your phone or computer to crash um, as some Big companies have recently found out that not every app is safe. So being careful that somebody has looked at that app before you've used it and made sure that it's okay to use. That's great. Those are really all great pointers. Um, I'm going to have a list of uh, some apps that have been researched and recommended that we will share along with this video if uh, parents want to look more into and these would these wouldn't be so much on the game side, but more on the assistive technology side. Um, now, what are your thoughts on on the games? Are there do you think that there are are any good value propositions there with some of the games that kids are playing on their phones? Absolutely, I think it's a good distraction at times, especially during this time. But it can also be a good learning experience. There's a lot of games out there to keep your brain working that keep you thinking and trying to figure out puzzles. And I think those are very, very important. I use them myself. I was just using one before this phone call to calm my nerves and say, hey, you know what? Everything's gonna be okay. You're just gonna talk to Diane. You're just gonna tell people what you do. No big deal. But things out there, like those kind of games that are keeping their concentration and helping their brain stay active, because that's the most important thing. We've gotta keep their brains active. If the longer your brain goes inactive, the more brain cells you're going to lose. Let's build those brain cells up. And I think games are a good way to do that. I know you don't hear many teachers saying that and go play some games. But in my group, we play games all the time. We play board games. We play computer games. We play phone games because it teaches them how to keep their brain active and how to calm their nerves and how to use their downtime appropriately. Yes, yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly uh, on that whole gamification aspect. I um, was working with a group on a school-based enterprise at a private school, and um, 
you know, I just know that there was one particular day when a young man came in who had been more of the quiet and the background uh, type of person. And he was so excited to tell me that he plays uh, dragons, Dungeons and Dragons. And he said, um, man, what we're doing right now, he's like, really reminds me of this. And just being able to connect the dots on a similarity between a game that he really enjoyed playing and this certain aspect of the project that we were working on was like, it just ignited him. And he was now really in the game, which was actually the business that we were working on. So it's, I love the way that you leverage everything with your young people. Like nothing is, is necessarily bad. It can be used in a way that's good, but we just have to be, um, you know, all things in moderation with it and also keep an eye on them and make sure they're staying safe and focused and all of that sort of thing. Um, so what, what other thoughts do you have along the lines of, you know, what's, what we're dealing with right now and how the cell phones are, um, you know, maybe the pros and cons of, you know, having that device. Mm -hmm. I think that the, the students, the interns, the kids, whatever you want to call them, that have the cell phones have gone through some training with their parents or with a teacher. Somebody has showed them how to use it. They've Or they've learned themselves. I'll tell you, my three-year-old granddaughter can use my cell phone. And she learned on her own. She didn't, she wasn't taught. So people are learning this very young age and working through it. And it's become a good distraction at times too much. I think it needs to be monitored, but why not use what you've got? If you've got the technology in your house to use your phone, to do your work for school or to check in with friends and family or to keep yourself calm by playing a game, why not use it? I'm a big advocate for using what you've got. And if you've got a cell phone, you've got a computer, and you've got a desktop and a laptop and a cell phone and there's three people in the house. Well, you've got three ways to connect. You've got three ways to do your work at the same time. Yeah. Share, share with your siblings, share with your parents, make sure that everybody gets a turn, make sure that everybody's getting their needs met. At this time, it's very important that everybody stay healthy, not only physically, but mentally, and make sure that you're sharing out there and that you're talking to each other and talking about what's going on. Uh, our students, knew what was going on before we left for spring break. I did talk with them and let them know that this possibly could happen. But if it did, I was going to keep them safe by bringing binders home with them so they wouldn't have to come into the school to get them and that they wouldn't have to be on the computer because it made them very nervous going on the computer. So we sent it home in writing for them so that they could go on and do their stuff in writing and then call me if they had questions. And they're mm -hmm. calling. They're calling me. Their parents are calling me. It's a great tool, and I really uh, I love the fact that we have them now, and almost everybody has them, and that's I think that's a good thing. I know people balk at cell phones and say, oh, we shouldn't be using them all the time. We shouldn't be using them for that. We shouldn't be using them for this, but I don't believe that. I believe that they were here for a reason. Now we see what the reason is to connect with other people in a time where we can't go out and see people in person. I can see Diane on the phone right now, and it eases my heart to know that she's safe and that her family's safe. And I can see my students and I know that they're okay and that they're safe. And I can talk with their parents and talk with them and calm their nerves some and send them a little picture to say, hey, I'm good, everything's okay. And it helps them with their day. So I think it's a good tool. I think they're good to have and I'm glad that most people have them now. Well, there you go. I mean, what more could you say? It's just like anything else. If you know how to use it and you're using it appropriately, then it can serve you well. It's just a matter of uh, being aware of the caveats and the downside and uh, making sure that we're staying for the positive uses, not, not getting our young people in trouble. So Tanya, thank you so much for joining me today. This was just a wonderful way to connect with you and at the same time share some of the conversations we have because we do, you know, as being in our field, we share ideas and we share ups and downs and, you know, um, luckily more successes and more positive things uh, get shared between us. And I think that um, if our families can be benefited by, you know, hearing the ways that we're using technology, that it just will help them to kind of cope with 
the situation better and um, and feel like, hey, you know, we're all going through this thing together. When has this ever happened before that the entire planet is dealing with the same thing at the same time? It's just unprecedented. So we're living through history, and even though there's moments when we're pulling our hair out, <laughs> but we're going to smile our way through it, and we're going to help each other through it. And um, I'm sure there will be more videos to come and more information to share moving forward.